Well, this is kind of the exciting part. It's kind of like show and tell. You put all this work in and then you have something to show for it. So um, first, I hope that some of you have um, at least saw some of the documents when you registered for this event. But if not, I can show you where you can find it um, on the DPLA website. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which I think is this one. Wait, hold on. Oh. There, can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, so this is the DPLA website. It's the pro DPLA website. Um, and it's under a couple different tabs. Um, you can find it under the membership program or the documentations and tools section. So we have our own little sub tab. It's called digital curation with DPLA resources. And this is just kind of a landing page where you can find the information about um, this task force and what we've created, as well as the members of the force. And then there's these two documents that are linked to um, on the page as well. So I'm actually going to start with our uh, long form guidelines document, because this is the first thing that we created um, to kind of put all of the information that we had accumulated from our environmental scan and our own experiences into one place. Um, and as you can see from the document down below, um, it's in the goal was that this document would provide professionals with a starting point for developing their own digital curation projects using many platforms. And like Kay Kayla said that um, we weren't able to identify just one that DPLA folks should use, but that's because there are so many different ones out there, um, which is kind of fun and it gives people more flexibility, but a lot of the procedures and processes and best practices kind of follow the same pattern regardless of the platform that you use. So um, then right off the bat, we also wanted to have a definition section because um, anywhere you go uh, looking for digital exhibits or online exhibits or virtual exhibits or digital curation in general, there's a lot of different um, definitions or understanding of what that might actually mean. Um, and so we put this definition section in there to help people kind of start off on the same foot. And the main thing that we wanted to point out is that digital curation is more than just like a slideshow of images. There needs to be some sort of interpretive framework or a theme that organizes the materials and the content that you share. Um, and then obviously uses some kind of a technological tool to share it. So that's where the digital component comes in. But it can, there's a, like I, like we wrote here, there's a, a lot of complexity and a wide variety of different types. Um, and then really the bulk of this guideline is sort of the planning and the procedures as well as the audience. We wanted this document to be something that DPLA member hubs could use, but also share within their networks. I know that many of us partner with other community organizations or collections um, that are somewhat indirectly connected to DPLA, but this could also be used by them if they wanna do their own digital curation. So um, the planning and process section is divided into all the sort of different things that you need to consider when you are planning a digital curation project, all the way from the beginning of scoping your exhibit to the end. And these are just some sort of guidelines and um, information that we compiled about what you should consider for platform selection and content selection, the kind of research that you really need to dig into, and even um, information about writing styles. And, you know, we have a link here to the Smithsonian Institution's Guide to Interpretive Writing for Exhibitions. And while that may be intended for physical exhibition writing, a lot of the guidelines um, about readability and those sorts of things still apply even when it's online. And then we mentioned um, considerations for layout, permissions, um, consider doing a fair use checklist uh, analysis to see whether or not you need a lot of extra permission, permissions or copyright issues. And then, of course, including metadata, fact checking, um, and publishing, and all that sort of stuff. And we also wanted to include in here that um, people always need to consider the permanence and the maintenance of their project. Once you make it, what happens to it? Where, where does it go? Those sorts of things. And then, um, as Kayla was mentioning, we kind of wanted to show several examples of different levels of digital creation projects that we found. And a lot of these came from when we did our our um, 
environmental scan to see what was out there. Some of it were projects that we had worked on, others we just admired and thought were useful. And so as you can see in this guidelines document, we have divided them into sort of bronze level, silver level, and gold level. And um, and the bronze level are, are sort of simple storytelling, simple interpretive frameworks, like a map or a timeline, uh, just a general narrative from beginning to end, usually just on one page. Um, and kind of basic context information, but doesn't get super in depth. And then at the other end is often very um, highly technical, maybe even a custom built website, um, a lot of other aspects that make it really um, complex and not necessarily better or worse, they're just different levels. And then the silver level is kind of everything in between. Um, we also included this uh, appendix with suggestions of platforms that either we have used or we've heard about that other people in cultural heritage organizations are using from libraries and archives at universities to local historical societies or even schools, um, student projects, those sorts of things. And then because everybody likes bibliographies, at least I do, uh, we have basically an annotated bibliography at the end, which is where we got a lot of the sort of information. Um, and I like to mention that there's um, there's a little explanation for why these sources are good for more information. So this thing is eight, nine pages, nine pages long. So it is really meant to just be like a one-stop shop to put all of this, all of the stuff that was in our brain and in our work as a task force into one location. But we do know that that is kind of like a lot to kind of go through when you're really just wanting to know where to start. And so in the process of this, we thought, you know what, we really like the Recollection Wisconsin's um, toolkit where it kind of has it on a one page grid format so you can really see in one view um, what kind of information you might want to consider when you're doing these kind of projects. So that's where we kind of made this project chart matrix is what we call it. Um, it also is kind of like a menu. So um, here you can also see the columns are in that bronze, silver and gold category of complexity, of, of lower complexity to higher complexity, but it really doesn't, you're not dictated to always have to stay in your column or stay in your lane. You can switch around um, and every project is different and unique and that's kind of what's fun. It's it's very flexible, but this is a, a, a more readable uh, view of the guides basically considering all of the things you might want to consider, like how much time can you devote to this project? If you only can do one to four months, then maybe you want to scale your project down a little bit. You also should consider who the personnel are that are going to work on this. Um, is it just one person that can spare a couple of days or months or weeks? Or do you want to have a large team, an advisory council, maybe even stakeholders, because maybe they want to be involved in telling their story with your materials. Um, so you can see there's a wide variety there. Um, targeted audience, kind of a lot of the similar um, things you might want to consider, even sort of the interactivity. So do you want just to have people scroll through your page, or do you want them to have um, digital humanities elements that they can interact with inside, or do you want them to have user contributed content or um, really interact in a, a more personal way um, online, or perhaps even in virtual reality? That's another option. And then again, um, kind of the document ends with these questions of longevity and also marketing. You put all this information out there, you make this great project, how are you going to publicize it? Um, so these are all just things to consider for anyone who's embarking on a digital creation project. Um, and like I said, it is kind of a menu and you can pick what works for you. And that makes all the projects so much um, more exciting, I think. So um, at that point, uh, maybe I should pause and um, see if anyone has any questions or, or thoughts about these documents right off the bat. Let's see here. Um, the question in the chat says, are there specific guidelines for how to integrate items from DPLA? Not specifically. Um, partly, I think, because we wanted these to be usable within and without of DPLA. Um, so, but we do talk about uh, selecting content and um, 
finding that information. And really a lot of it depends on your platform too, because if you can, you might need to download an image from DPLA and then upload it to your platform, or you can link to it more directly. Um, so yeah, we didn't include specific guidelines for DPLA integration, but... Um, I'll, yeah, I'll add that we used, um, DPLA had like a creation guide yes. that they had when, um, when they were still creating exhibits. Um, and we did use some of that um, information from that initial guide in our guide as well, mm -hmm. um, in terms of content selection and also in terms of like permissions. Um, so um, some of the guidance that they have um, has been passed into this document as well. And that was specifically using DPLA uh, resources. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I thank you for bringing it up, Kayla, because um, yeah, we did look and see what, because um, DPLA does have several online exhibitions and when those were being made, they made guidelines for how to make it specifically for DPLA using that particular platform, um, which you can still see today. And so um, since we weren't really being platform specific, we didn't get into those sorts of nitty gritty details. Um, but if anyone is interested, I'm sure we could find a way to share that specific um, with the network as well. Any other thoughts right off the bat or shall we do some examples? I saw someone unmute themselves. You're also welcome to unmute yourself to ask a question. You don't have to put it in the chat. Has anyone used these for a digital display? So these are new. I don't I don't know that anyone has used these yet. Um, but uh, I think you could, depending on what platform you chose and what kind of digital displays you have, you could design, you could use these to design an exhibit that would auto play on a digital display potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I um in my work with the Minnesota Digital Library, I create digital curation projects um a couple of a couple of them per year. And so I do usually walk through these um these questions each time that I'm scoping it out and planning it out. Um so yes. They do apply. Oh Sheila said. Yes. Yeah, so that that is another good point too, in that a lot of this wasn't necessarily um, groundbreaking, like reinventing the wheel kind of a thing. It was all really a compilation of, of procedures and best practices that exist and are being implemented in multiple locations already. We just put them all into this easily findable place. So. Duration aggregation of sorts. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes brain dump yeah okay so um i can share a couple examples so you can um see what i mean in terms of um the bronze silver gold level um i picked a couple from the guidelines that um that i mentioned already the links at the end um but one of them that um that would be in the sort of bronze category is from the white house historical association and it's a basically it's a timeline that you scroll through that talks about slavery in the president's neighborhood um, around the White House. And so you can see there's just, you know, kind of general context introduction information. And then there's this timeline bar that scrolls down instead of left and right, but that works too. Um, and then there's these embedded, embedded digital images or maps um, with a little bit of context information. They all have uh, it looks like links to further information about that particular item. But if you want, you can just keep scrolling. And then it embed, um, embeds these dates um, throughout the timeline, even just general things like Massachusetts becomes the first colony to recognize slavery and then Seven Years War and those kind of things. So it doesn't really um, devote the entire exhibit to all those different points, but it kind of places these 
materials in the context of wider things going on um, at that time. So, and there's, like I said, there are, if people are interested in more information, there are ways to get more information, but on, on the first glance, it is uh, a single page scrolling down, reading a story, basic narrative. Um, another one that would be more in the silver category is actually a DPLA um, exhibit that is uh, was developed using the original DPLA guidelines for that. Um, and in this sense, you can see that it's kind of your typical online exhibit where you have an intro page, you have multiple category uh, sections that you can link to, um, and the content is divided into these thematic slash uh, chronological categories. And then you can see, again, like these information and context about these digital pieces um, grouped together by theme. And again, linking to the materials if people want more information. And then the gold exhibit that I found, I actually attended a, a session about this where they talk, the people who created this exhibit talked about what they did. And it's called I N. I Am an American, The Authorship and Activism of Alice Dunbar Nelson by the Rosenbach. And the first thing to notice, it's a custom-built website. Uh, it also includes a podcast, a blog with related information, ways to respond and um, interact with the content. Um, and it also, I thought, was really interesting. They had a, um, a group of community members as their sort of advisory council. So it wasn't just a single curator at the Rosenbach saying, these are amazing works of literature, I want to put it on this website, they really had a very, very active um, group of people that um, participated in the telling of this story. So again, it is content divided into sections and themes. Um, but it just, it goes a little bit more deeply than say, perhaps the White House timeline at the beginning that I showed. So I just wanted to kind of show these sort of uh, this wide variety, these examples of what um, is out there, and uh, you know, giving people some ideas of of how we categor or how we came up with these ideas of bronze, silver, and gold. Um, and at this point, I think I will stop my share, and we can um, maybe see if anyone else has any examples they want to share. Yeah, and since we're at the discussion portion of the session. Uh, we encourage you all to turn on your cameras if you are comfortable and also um, to use your microphones uh, if you want to speak or ask a question. You can still use the chat and you don't have to turn on the camera, but just to make it a little bit more of a conversational environment. All right. So, um... The first question we can start with is, are any of you uh, at your hubs or organizations engaging in any sort of curation work like this? And if so, what are you doing? Anyone want to chime in? No. Nope. Could you repeat the question? Is it? Yes. Sorry, Rachel. The question is, I was just curious to know if any of you are, are doing any digital curation work right now at your hubs or in your organizations. And if so, what are you doing? And um, even what, what platforms you might be using? Sure. I can um, start a little. <clears throat> so I am, my name is Rachel Whitman and I am at the University of Utah at the Marriott Library. And um, we have a pretty um, robust digital exhibits program. I'll copy in the link. Um, we use Omeka S for our platform and we've done a number of customizations. Um, all of the themes that we are using are also on our GitHub, which I will dig up, not at this moment, um, but put that in the chat too, in case there's any Omega S users that are interested in um, some of our themes that we've created. Um, we've been pretty successful in creating our own digital exhibits for special collections, but also partnering with museums on campus um, and faculty to highlight some of their um, scholarship projects. 
Yeah, it's cool. And that that's what's fun about these sort of projects is they do really lend themselves well to collaboration with, you know, maybe content experts and digital collections all together in one place. Yeah. And one thing we've really leveraged too with the content experts, especially being um, on campus and having um, faculty that do have, you know, specific areas of study, mm -hmm. collaborating um, with a faculty member who is much more knowledgeable about a certain topic um, than any um, faculty or staff in the library. So one example of that is um, I worked on this uh, pretty large exhibit on the history of air quality in Utah, which I partnered with um, a faculty member who's also um, he's an atmospheric science professor um, so that was like it was a big undertaking but there was it was uh, really beneficial um, to be able to highlight you know all of our historical materials but also lean on the subject expertise to do a lot of the writing um, and just kind of the, the planning of that. If no one else wants to go, I can let you all know a little bit about what Georgia is, too. Um, there, within Georgia, there are a couple of different big exhibit um, projects going on. One is one that is done um, through the Public Library Service, and they do it as, as a cohort model using Omeka with uh, advisors and folks from the um, public libraries sign up to be part of the cohort. Um, they do a, an exhibit um, from start to finish using materials that are found in the Digital Library of Georgia. So in theory, there should be no new scanning or anything for that kind of exhibit creation. And um, again, they have a, a board of sort of advisors who help along with the um, process. And so that's been fairly successful. I think the cohorts are usually a couple people a year. So there, are, there aren't a ton of exhibits turning through, and they're they're much more local history oriented. Uh, the Digital Library of Georgia has been working really closely with our partner at Georgia Humanities and the Georgia Press, the the New Georgia Encyclopedia, and so um, we largely based our process on that of the original DPLA guidelines. And um, what we've done, what we have done is we have hired graduate students who are um, at, at a university in Georgia, um, and they they do a topic proposal, and then they um, they're contracted for 120 hours to um, curate and select materials um, from from DLG's collections. And then, um, and then uh, guidance comes from New Georgia Encyclopedia and DLG staff as they're developing their um, their exhibits. And and one of the lessons that we, hard lessons that we learned was that um, really, if if you're wanting to do more in depth exhibits, um, the topics need to be something that folks are pretty familiar with already. So probably the most successful exhibits that we've done were one around, one around convict labor, one around um, uh, newspapers in Georgia, and one about women in the progressive era. Um, when we've had newer students, the amount of students who were uh, interested in a topic but newer to it, um, it was just way more work than we could handle. Um, and so um, that that has sort of helped us sort of scale our program in a in a different way. And another way that we found be, it to be very successful was working with um, one that we worked on with University of Maryland and Georgia State. Um, the they they used a grad student who was um, funded through um, through a clear grant to develop the exhibit and primary source sets. And then we'll be partnering with Georgia State on a different exhibit in the future um, that's gonna be funded with soft, soft money. So that was a really good way, that was a way that we, that was really good for us was partnering with um, 
others who are at the at the beginning of their projects and and sort of um, rolling that into their um, their money asks. I think that 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 your last point is a good uh, segue into another question about like what kind of support do people have to create exhibits or if you don't like if you're not creating exhibits like what kind of support are you looking for um, what would you what are your needs there so if you have it tell us about it if you don't tell us tell us what you're what you need in order to do this work. Uh, I think a lot of us operate on soft money and uh, that doesn't always, it doesn't, that's not always good for longevity. <laughs> Yeah, I can say, I mean, I've usually, um, it's usually part of my position to do the um, digital exhibits, but it's also, it's something that's, um, it's difficult to maintain a consistent output for because some of these big projects, I mean, they, I think I've always underestimated the time involved in every digital exhibit. It actually takes quite a bit of time and there's lots of invisible labor when you're like trying to reformat um, pages just to see what looks better. You know, there's there's quite a bit that goes into just the um, the technology aspect of it. Um, I I used to have a like 0.25 FTE um, through student employees, um, but I really am trying to lean towards um, having time carved out from. Um, permanent faculty and staff in the library because there's a training aspect to the work that we tend to lose when we have student employees uh, work on the exhibits. I also um, tend to think that um, it is high level uh, work to do this sort of create these um, guides to our collections. And um, I'd like to have, you know, um, our archivists and our librarians work on them more. Yeah, and I think you, um, sorry, didn't mean to jump on you, Kaylee. You're good. I think you bring up a good point in that each time you have a new, like it's a great idea to to have guest curators or student workers or someone who um, is eager for this kind of experience to do this kind of work, but it's also, it takes a lot of time to train them. And so um, Sheila mentioned that they have a single template for the exhibits. Um, and we kind of do that too at, at the Minnesota Digital Library. We've already kind of explored uh, different platforms and we know which ones work relatively well and so um it's not like we have to learn how to work the platform and the content all every single time we do a new exhibit or a new timeline or a new map or a new primary source set we already kind of have that template that information already set so if we do have guest people come in um they don't have to do that kind of heavy thinking, I guess, but it is still, there's always, you know, time resources and, and personnel are the major, um, the major factors and whether or not we can do this work. So. Yeah. And I'll just say, um, at my hub, I'm the only employee. So, uh, I don't have the resources to do this kind of work right now. Um, at a, at any scale. So um, having, uh, seeing what other people are doing is is very inspirational and it helps me get an idea of what to advocate for if we wanna do this stuff. Um, and we've been working with our state library here. Um, they're getting a, a platform up to host content for, from smaller, um, libraries and um, they've ensured that the developer that they're working with, um, they're going to be using the newer version of Islandora to do this um, hosting. They're working with the developer to incorporate exhibit uh, capabilities in that platform so that they can take the content and create curated um, exhibits um, with the content that's being added to this platform. So we'll be working with them on um, hopefully uh, being able to do that and do some training um, and, and work to develop resources. But at the moment, we don't have any kind of capability and it will be limited to the content that's in that platform, unfortunately. 
um, at this time, but we're hoping to be able to expand that to include um, like using APIs and things include content from other sources as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's a perspective from a very low resource place that is not currently doing this, uh, what we're trying to aspire to. Does anyone else want to share? Hi, everyone. I'll jump in here. Thank you all for uh, presenting on the work that you've been doing and sharing um, the digital exhibitions, virtual exhibits that everyone has been working on. Um, I'm Christine Kim. I'm um, with the California Digital Library, and I support Calisphere, which is the um, aggregation of digital collections in California. And I think this is so interesting. Um, we've been um, working with some folks at UC Irvine, which is one of our uh, campus partner institutions, um, along with um, a consultant who's actually on the call today, Sharon Mizoda. And so we've been working on a project um, to really try to assess a representation of community-centered archives and community-based archives in um, aggregations. So we've been curious about learning about, um, you know, how representative is um, beginning with like the Calisphere aggregation, but maybe just like aggregation at large and thinking about like whether there are systems-based onboarding requirements that, you know, may inadvertently be exclusionary to surfacing community-centered archives and perspectives. And so we've been digging into these types of questions and really trying to think about how aggregation may influence the historical record, especially since aggregation does support discovery as well. And so beginning with those questions, we've been also kind of thinking about, you know, digital exhibitions and the role that it might play within digital aggregations since so many of our services are utilizing digital exhibitions. And so um, we've been thinking, you know, what if there's a way that digital exhibitions could, um, you know, be directly utilized by communities um, in order to maybe they can like, use the aggregation, select records from digital collections, and then um, add historical and interpretive context that may help surface and highlight their experiences and really tell stories that are not in the mainstream and particularly use their own words to tell those stories. So um, those are some questions we've been kind of thinking around and um, we've been really interested in exploring like how can we develop a program that might support this pathway. Um, we do have a digital exhibitions program service <laughs> type feature. It's temporarily paused as we do this assessment work, but some of the um, recent exhibitions that we had worked on kind of like inspired this thinking. And I'll just drop in a couple of links. Um, one in particular is an exhibition called um, Afterlives of the Vietnam War, The Art of Southeast Asian Refugees, which focuses on um, uh, Vietnam War refugees and their efforts to document and share the experiences through, through artwork. And then another that we had worked on recently is um, called They Were Really Us, the UCSF Community's Early Response to AIDS. Uh, which highlights how uh, UCSF leaders had um, worked in the 80s and 90s to not only identify the virus, but also launch the first AIDS clinic, um, which led to this model of like holistic care. So the, um, we're, we're interested in trying to surface uh, stories. And, um, and I think we really see exhibitions as like a way to tell important stories through like, you know, thoughtful selections of digital primary sources and um, brought to life through historical context. I think um, some lessons learned while working on these was that it is like really resource intensive and we really leaned hard on working with partner institutions. Um, but I think in thinking about models in which we might be able to work with community-centered archives and community-based organizations, I think like compensation for those folks is going to be like a big part of it. And um, I know that we don't currently have those resources like 
mapped out. And um, so I, I think we're kind of like trying to figure out how do we tell these stories or how do we empower folks to tell these stories, um, but also make sure that folks are compensated for that work since it is a lot of intense work. And I think, yeah, I really appreciate the the different levels of effort that you all mapped out. And I think that'll be a good way to kind of think about um, amount of work and resources involved as well. So um, in terms of resources we have available, it's at, at least on our team, it's basically um, I, I've been working on supporting the service, um, but otherwise I've been really leaning on partnering with folks to um, work on the actual curation aspect of it. Yeah, that's, you brought together a lot of the, the, the industry professional conversations right now around um, uh, equity, um, De like decolonization and, and bringing uh, minoritized voices to the forefront. Um, and I think also a good point about how aggregations do aid in discovery. Um, and a lot of the work that we've been doing um, to improve discovery in aggregations with metadata quality, um, reparative metadata work, right? But that's also extremely labor intensive. So doing an exhibit can be a way to kind of highlight some core things, uh, pull your resources into some concentrated efforts, um, and then you can link out to these other larger sets of resources from that uh, concentrated effort into the exhibit. Um, so I think those are all great ways to tie all of those things together and really maximize the efforts in all of those areas um, to bring to light those kind of hidden histories that have uh, kind of been pushed to the margins uh, previously. And the and the point of uh, compensation is a really big one because uh, again, we, we have to kind of advocate for those resources to ensure that we're building those reciprocal partnerships that are, um, beneficial to the communities and not extractive um, that we're trying to highlight. So thank you so much for sharing that, Christine. You really tied all that together really well. That's that's great work. <laughs> um, Molly. Listening to Christine just now, um, I'm wondering because of these toolkits are fabulous, um, but I know also um, that you are a task force and are potentially, I don't know if you're wrapping up your work um, at this point. Um, would there be interest or in having some sort of way for us to continue to be able to connect those of us who are interested in this work, whether it be through a community of practice or something, even <laughs> email chain? I'm, I'm being a little funny, but um, but I think there are values in these conversations. I mean, I was, I was listening to Christine. I was very interested in her work and wanted to learn more. And I, I'm at the Minnesota Digital Library with Stephanie, which is why I've been kind of quiet and just listening because she's got it covered. But um, yeah, we're actively engaged in this work too. And I, I'm speaking for Stephanie but I know for me, I would love to connect with others who are interested in this work. So just wanted to throw that out there while we're all on the call, if there are people that might be, if that's something people are interested in or not. Yeah, that's a really good point, Molly. And, and you are right, this is a temporary task force and we are wrapping up our work today, um, but the materials will live um, indefinitely on DPLA. And I guess that would be a question for you folks at DPLA, if you would be able to facilitate some sort of an email um, or Google group or something like that, that we could continue the conversation. Because um, that I think is, sorry to sorry to jump in, Kat, too, but um, that has been the biggest point that I've enjoyed about this task force is knowing that we're not the only ones out there doing this kind of work and having these thoughts. So um, continuing would be great. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, given that I wasn't completely prepared for this, I think probably the easiest thing to do is that if you're interested, if you could just send a quick note to info at dp.la and I'll put that in the chat and then we can set up at least a Google group to keep the conversation going and figure out what forum would be the right thing for it. So it doesn't have to be anything lengthy, just email and say digital curation, I'm in and we'll take care of it. Thank you. Depending on how formal you're thinking it might be a good topic for the next network council meeting to, to think about how to carry it forward, whether that's a working group or something similar shapes, you know? Yeah, that's, it's a good, 
I mean, it definitely there's interest in it. I think also just the timing with DPLA and it's all its new visioning process and things like that, that that's one reason we wanted to at least have kind of like a final statement in terms of these documents, but that doesn't mean we have to stop the conversation. So I think something a little more on the informal line would work better for most of us until we know kind of what steps we're going to be taking. But um, yeah, it does seem weird to just kind of be done. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good a good option. Thank you, Kat. Um, could you mention a little more about the Google group for digital curation um, that you wrote about in the chat, Ima, Ima? I don't know anything about that. Um, yes, sorry. Um, I think it's, it's, I don't know who started it, but it seems to be open to anyone, kind of. Um, and I can put the address in here in the chat. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's just, it's described as just like a, for people who have interest in it. And there's, different conversation threads that people have started and um yeah I'm not I mean like I've subscribed to it but I I don't know anything about like the founding of it or or anything I just kind of check out what comes through there but I know um smaller organizations can have a difficult time trying to like create new spaces for people and so I figure if it might be easier for DPLA to glom onto something that's already in existence than duplicating something. Yeah, that's super great to know. Thank you so much for sharing. It's also possible we have an email list, maybe cat that can just be converted to a public list. Um, the list for the task force? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the all hubs list is also a good place to continue the conversation too, so that it's not just network hubs. Um, I see questions get posted in there pretty infrequently, so maybe we can build that into a more conversational space as well. Um. <laughs> That's a good idea, Kayla, thank you. So we have, we have about five more minutes. Um, if anyone else wants to share, please chime in um, or share any more links in the chat. Um, I guess uh, the final question for the group is, do you feel like there's anything that we missed in the guidelines um, or anything that you really liked about them? I know you might not have had a chance to look at them in depth yet, but uh, On a basic level, I like that you provided both the long and the short form. It's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to share is um, I also do a bit of analysis on usage statistics on at least a Calisphere site. And something um, I've been observing is that our exhibitions are the most like heavily used relative to its size, um, part of the site. And so I think there is um, a lot of great potential for see getting extra eyes um, onto these stories. And um, I think the historical and interpretive context really helps folks kind of like guide through these otherwise like uh, digital objects um, that are on the site. So I think, um, yeah, I think just thinking about like 
you know, these are resources that are on the internet and the internet can be kind of like a difficult place to navigate and um, something we've been um, trying to be conscious of when developing um, these, the exhibitions that I linked to earlier is, um, yeah, because these are living on the web and thinking about how to um, cite or reference any, um, any, any like articles or, you know, anything that's like factual, just to make sure that those resources are also discoverable and to make sure that any assertions are backed up by some, something that's like real, <laughs> um, is something that we've been like growingly conscious of. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We have also found that to be true of the DPLA aggregation. The most used resources are the ones that are in the um, curated resources, whether they be the primary source sets or in the curated exhibits. Um, and I think uh, there was some important feedback in the recent open board meeting for DPLA about contextualizing the aggregation because there is such a large number of objects in there. Um, so uh, I think that was valuable feedback. And if you agree with that, maybe share that with the DPLA team as well so that they incorporate that in their strategic visioning process that we would like more of that. Um, and we feel that should be a priority. Um, if it, if at all possible for them to do that. We understand there might be constraints, but we think it's a valuable thing to advocate for um, and get resources for. So um, yeah, I guess with that, uh, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, and I wanna thank again, all the task force members for all their hard work. Um, you did an amazing job. And I think we have a really great resource that we've been able to share. Hopefully we can continue these conversations more online with a larger community and uh, and continue doing all of the all of this great work for our users. Thank you, Task Force. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Bye. <laughs>